I'd like to introduce the sermon today with a little story about a lion. This lion was walking down the path in the jungle and he saw this little mouse run across the path and he let out this tremendous roar. And he asked the little mouse, he said, who's the king of the jungle? And the mouse was shaking, he said, you are. He <laughs> ran away. And the lion puffed up his chest, walked down the path a little bit further, saw a bunch of monkeys. He lets out this incredible growl. Again, the monkeys scatter up into the trees and he says, who's the king of the jungle? And they say, you are. And they climb clear to the top of the tree. Puffs out his chest, walks down the trail a little bit, walks out into a clearing, sees this big elephant out there. Walks up beside the elephant, lets out this great big growl and says, who's the king of the jungle? The elephant turns around very quietly, looks down his long trunk at the lion, a couple of tense moments, and then the elephant takes his trunk, wraps it around the lion, tosses him up in the air, through the air, over his back, and the lion lands in a pile of dust in a rumpled heap. And then the elephant turns quietly around to see what's going to happen. The lion gets up, shakes the dust off, and looks at the elephant and says, Look, just because you didn't know the answer to my question, you don't need to get sore about it. <laughs> the lion had a problem, <clears throat> but he didn't recognize what the problem was. But I want to talk about that problem today. Not about lions, but about us. You know, when I first put this sermon together, I was planning for the Days of Unleavened Bread, where we're talking about getting rid of personal leaven. But thinking about this over the last several days, the topic is really bigger than just personal leaven. That it's something that affects not only us <clears throat> as individuals, but it affects organizations, it affects churches, and it affects nations. I want to talk about that today. <clears throat> The subject I want to address affects each of us very, in a very personal way because it influences who we are. It influences how we're perceived by other people. It influences what we will become as we grow. And it will determine whether our life is going to be successful and happy or whether it's going to be unhappy and full of a lot of frustrations. I want to talk about two things in the sermon. Two very conflicting attitudes, two very different attitudes. You know, when I was preparing the sermon, I was trying to figure out how to introduce it. And I played with a number of introductions, but we were having dinner with uh, uh, one of my sons and his family. We had ordered some Chinese food. Now, when you order Chinese food as a takeout, they give you the food, and then what else do they give you? A bag of fortune cookies. <laughs> you know, little, little cookies that are hollow in the center, and they have either a saying or a prediction or something. So one of my granddaughters opened up her cookie and she read it and screwed up her nose. And I said, what does it say? She said, it says, attitudes are more important than facts. She said, what does that mean? And then she decided there were other more important things to do, like eating the cookie instead of getting involved in a philosophical discussion. <laughs> but you know, I got to thinking about it. <clears throat> The statement is, has there some truth to it, but there's also some dangerous aspects there. That attitudes may be more important than facts sometimes. You know, we got a check uh, some time ago that came into the church for, I forget, it was a big amount of money, either $10,000, maybe $100,000, whatever it was, I don't remember. But when it was taken to the bank, the, church the, the, the check bounced. So someone in the accounting office called the person that wrote the check and said, uh, 
we really appreciated getting your check, but it, it bounced. There wasn't enough money in the account. And the person said, well, I knew there wasn't enough when I wrote the check, but I wanted to do something for the church, so I prayed that God would put the money in the account. <laughs> the attitude was tremendous. <laughs> but the facts didn't agree with the attitude. <laughs> but you know, there's, there's another aspect though where attitudes are important. You know, who we are is a fact. Who you are is a fact. You know, people, if they watch you and they realize you're an honest person, you're a hardworking person, you're a kind, patient person, they'll conclude you're a good person which is probably very factual. But if you use bad language, you're a liar, you're lazy, you're a thief, you're a bully, you're an adulterer, they'll conclude you're not a very good person, which is a fact. But you know, the fact of who we are and what we do and how we act is often determined by our attitudes. Attitudes are important. I want to talk about two attitudes today that impact us in some very profound ways. I've entitled the sermon, Pride and Vanity. Pride and Vanity. I realize none of us have any pride, so we don't need to talk about that. No, we all do. We all do. We all have plenty of pride, one way or another, but sometimes we don't recognize it, and sometimes we don't realize it. And this is the, the challenge for all of us. The humility is something we need to develop. And the sooner we develop that, the better our life is going to be. So in the sermon today, I want to talk about what God says about these two attitudes, pride and vanity and why these subjects are important to God, and why the Bible focuses so much attention on both of these attitudes. I also want to look at what the world has concluded about these two attitudes, which I think is very instructive. What the world has concluded over a period of centuries. And then I want to talk about how important the subject is to all of us today. Now, just a word of caution before we begin. I think sometimes we can downplay the seriousness of pride and vanity. We might say, well, you know, he's a little proud or she's a little proud, but, you know, overall he's a pretty good person. Or we might think, you know, I know I've got a, lo a little problem with pride. And we tend to downplay these things. But, you know, if that's our attitude... You know, your pride's not, not as serious as committing adultery. Pride's not as serious as getting drunk. But, you know, if that's our attitude, we need to <laughs> recalibrate a little bit and reprogram our approach. Because these are serious attitudes. As I mentioned, I started working on this uh, to present at the spring holy days, which I did, but I got to thinking about it the last couple of days, and the subject is really a lot bigger than just some leaven. And it's something we need to think about as we go through the year. If you turn quickly to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, you know, we turned there and read those during the days of unleavened bread. But what is being described here is a process that God is using to prepare sons and daughters to become part of his family. I think sometimes we can look at the days of unleavened bread, getting rid of the leaven and just eating unleavened bread for seven days. And well, that's the ritual that we go through. Kind of like if you're a Catholic, you do your laps around the beads or you say your uh, uh, Holy Mary, Mother of God thing. You just, th these are rituals that you do. But we can't do that with the Days of Unleavened Bread. This is describing a process that God is using to prepare sons and daughters to become part of his family. 
And that process is described here, beginning in verse uh, 20, start in verse 28. It says, let a man or let a person examine himself or herself, and so let them eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Whoever eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, not appreciating the incredible sacrifice that Jesus Christ made of his life to pay the penalties of our sins and so that we could be healed. If we don't understand what we're doing in not discerning the Lord's body, we're drinking judgment to ourselves. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, if we would examine ourselves carefully, our attitudes. Do I have a problem with vanity? Am I appropriately humble? Or am I perceived in another way? And sometimes we may not see these things, but if we ask someone, ask your mate, ask your kids, ask a friend. You know, we had an assignment one time in Ambassador College in speech class to talk with another student and get an evaluation. I was a freshman there at college. I was also in the faculty, and I was trying to fulfill the assignment. I'd met a girl that I'd been talking to a little bit, and I noticed in the cafeteria we would duel with each other mentally, kind of dig here and dig there and so on. I thought, I think I'll ask her for an evaluation. And she gave me one. <laughs> it wasn't what I was expecting. <laughs> I said, look, we have this assignment. And I said, I've gotten to know you a little bit. Would you give me an evaluation? She looked at me. She said, really? You want one? <laughs> now let me set the stage. I just gotten a doctor's degree. I just gotten a new suit. And I was a faculty member eating in the faculty dining room. And I thought I was just really, my heart was in the work doing everything. She said, uh, I think you're pretty vain. That took me back a little bit. But then we had been dueling on other things, so I said, well, I figured if anybody could spot that, you could. <laughs> and then she said, now who's supposed to evaluate who? <laughs> but you know, I had to think about it. I was just trying to do what I thought I was supposed to do. <laughs> I bought a suit when I came into the church. I bought a briefcase. <laughs> Let my hair grow a little bit longer because I had a, a buzz cut. Um, but I was trying to meet a certain image. But I realized I was also vain. A lot of vanity there. And it was a come down. <clears throat> you know, I didn't get mad, but it was just kind of sobering. You get slapped in the face verbally, and it causes you to think. But we're supposed to evaluate ourselves, to look carefully and ask God, God, please show me what I need to change. And you might add, be merciful <laughs> when you do that. Be merciful, but show me how I need to change so I can be in your family. So I can develop in a manner that you can use me in your time and in your way. <clears throat> So this is part of the process. It's an important part of the process. You know, how different would our nation be if this was a national priority where our president and our leaders would encourage the nation to examine ourselves and the example that we set for the world. You know, for those of you that have traveled around the world different places, you know, Americans are perceived as people with a lot of money in their pockets, people that want to fix the world because we want to help everybody. But not everybody wants to be helped the way we would like to help them. But we're not alone in these things. I was reading a book on China recently. I think it was entitled China, the Wolf in the World, written by a reporter or a journalist who spent quite a bit of quite a bit of time in China, especially during the Cultural Revolution. He said, I never felt I was accepted there. As a foreigner, I was tolerated. 
and they look down on us because we're foreigners. Because they have a history of being the middle kingdom, the central <laughs> part of the world, the most important nation in the earth. And as they become more powerful, we're going to see more of this. You know, different nations are perceived different ways. <clears throat> Turn to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Because this is the goal that we need to be shooting for. Philippians chapter 2 <clears throat> and verse 5. Paul mentions here to the church of Philippi, let this mind, this perception, this perspective be in you, which was also in Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God did not consider himself a robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself became obedient unto death, and then God exalted him. But this is the perspective that God wants to see in us, a humble perspective, not a vanity-filled perspective, but a humble perspective. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And then in John 17, you don't need to turn there, but we read this on the night of the Passover where Christ is praying. It's an instructive prayer. He's praying <clears throat> with his disciples, but he's teaching them at the same time. And he says, Father, thank you for those that you've given me, and I pray that they may become one as we are one. That my disciples can develop the perspective that I have, that you have, that we can have as a family. This is the perspective that God wants us to develop. This is the goal of the process. <clears throat> it's not just a ritual but it's an extremely important process where God is recreating himself, creating us in his image. But how do we go about this process? <clears throat> where do we start? What do we do? Let me just define some terms here very quickly. What does it mean, and how would you recognize if you're proud or if you have a problem with pride? How would you recognize that? You look in the mirror and a little light comes on. Pride, pride, pride. <laughs> no, it's not that easy. It's not that easy. I would encourage you to look up some definitions for the words pride and proud. Vain is one of the words. Conceited is one of the words. Having an inordinate, inordinate amount of self-esteem. I know I'm humble, but how can I help not being... <laughs> humble. Being opinionated. When you get in discussions, is it your opinion that has always floated? Well, here's what I think. I know what the church thinks, but here's what I think. If we move in those directions, brethren, we need to be very careful. Having an air of superiority. You walk into a room and you expect everybody to stop and, oh, he's here. <laughs> or she has arrived. You know, some people function that way. <clears throat> Having an attitude, well, I know better. I know what you think, but I really, here's this is what we really need to do, because I know. Arrogant? Are you perceived as arrogant? You know all the answers? I don't mean to tramp on any toes, but I mean, these are the definitions that you come across. Uh, a feeling of self-importance. I had a guy react to me one time at the feast. Uh, he'd been to another country, he'd gotten into health, some, pro some health problems and so on. He was blaming a church for that. And we met at the feast, and I didn't have any particular office at that time. I was just a local pastor or an, an area pastor. And he just started to unload on me about what the church had done to him and this and that and the other thing. And I could have said, don't you know who I am? And he probably said, I don't care who you are. <laughs> he had something he wanted to get off his chest. And I didn't react to him. I just listened. I said, uh, wow, you, you've really got a lot on your, your plate. I said, uh, let's talk about this in a day or two. And two or three days later, I went up to him and said, do you want to continue our conversation? He said, no. He'd gotten off his chest what he wanted off his chest. 
but I could have reacted in a very different way, but it wouldn't have solved any problems. Being boastful, and sometimes when you start talking to somebody, they, they dominate the conversation, and they just go on and on and on. <clears throat> this desire to be important is part of being proud. So this is what we need to be looking for and asking God, God, please show me if I'm this way. Help me to see it. What about humble and humility? The word humble comes from a Latin word that we get our word humus from. Now, what is humus? <laughs> Dirt. <laughs> Earthy. A person that's down to earth is humble. They're down to earth. What you see is what you get. They don't put on any airs. They don't pretend to be something that they're not. They're down to earth. They're not proud. They're not vain. They're not haughty. <clears throat> you know, the lion was haughty. You don't know who the king of the, <laughs> the jungle is? What's the matter with you? Well, it was all in his mind. A humble person is unpretentious. They're compliant. They can work with other people in a harmonious way. They don't always have to be you know, putting stripes on their shoulders and being acknowledged for being somebody important. They're modest. They're modest. They realize they're not the king of the jungle. <laughs> they don't rub people the wrong way. Have you ever been around people that you just don't want to be around any longer because they rub you the wrong way? It just turns you off. <clears throat> They're conscious. A humble person is conscious of their own limitations. You know, Paul talks about that. Not many wise, not many mighty are called. But God has chosen the foolish of the world to confound the wise. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. These are things, brethren, we need to take time to look for in our lives, this process. God wants us to take time to examine ourselves. You're not going to go to bed some night full of vanity and wake up in the next morning, ah, I'm free. I'm a totally different, humble person. Now, <laughs> it doesn't happen that way. You know, when I was in college, there was a lot of stuff going around about sleep learning. Now you can turn on a tape recorder and you can sit there and you play the lectures and wake up in the morning, you can go take a test and uh, remember all the answers. I tried it. It doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. <clears throat> and developing humility and getting rid of pride is the same way. You know, if you've ever smoked cigarettes or had a problem with drinking, it's not that easy to change some of these things. If you've got a problem with vanity, it's not going to be that easy to change. You're going to have to recognize it and work at it. It's going to take some time. But we need to be able to recognize the two qualities so that we can shoot for one and literally shoot the other one, <laughs> get rid of it. What I'd like to do next is to talk a little bit about what the world has come to understand about these two attitudes. You might think, we can't learn anything from the world. Well, I think we can. Because people recognize there are problems <clears throat> with pride. They recognize that. They recognize there are benefits from humility. <clears throat> Let me just mention several quotes, and you can find the same things when you look for them. A Hebrew proverb says that pride is the mask over one's faults. Pride is the mask over one's faults. You just don't acknowledge you have any, any, any faults. So <laughs> this is what pride in, it does. <clears throat> Another one said, this was 1825, pride is like a magnet, it points to itself. But unlike a magnet, it repels others. You ever try and put the, the wrong ends of magnets together? They, <clears throat> they, they literally jump apart. The paradox of pride, I thought this was interesting. The paradox of pride. Pride makes some people look ridiculous and it prevents other people from becoming ridiculous because <laughs> they see the reactions to a person with pride. John Adams, one of the presidents of the United States, 
He said, vanity, this desire to be admired, is deeply rooted in the human heart. That almost sounds like Jeremiah 17, 9. The human heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Where would John Adams come up with an idea like this? John Adams said he read the Bible every morning. So he came across these things. Another one said, um, pride, although it says, it is always touches of vanity that betray us. In other words, it comes out at the wrong times (laughs) and gets us in trouble. See, the world is making these observations. T.S. Eliot said in 1950, he said, harm, half the harm in the world has come by people who want to be important. Half the harm in the world has been caused by people that want to be important. Think Hitler, think Napoleon. You can plug some other names in there. A couple on a lighter, fra- a lighter uh, vein it says, every donkey likes to hear himself bray. There's an even better one. Until the donkey tried to clear the fence, he thought he was a deer. <laughs> the facts overrule the attitudes <laughs> in that particular case. Aesop, the Greek writer from the 6th century BC, said, fools take for themselves the respect given to their office. Fools take to themselves the respect that's given to their office. You know, sometimes people are appointed to jobs, they're ordained as a deacon or an elder, and all of a sudden they they feel very important. You know, we do need to respect the office, but when we're in that office, we have to earn and keep that respect. It just doesn't come automatic. It doesn't stay there automatically. But the world has understood these things. In terms of humility, what has the world noticed? One person said, the most difficult of all virtues is humility, and nothing dies harder than the desire to be esteemed. You know, we all want to be thought well of. That's not wrong. But we've got to be careful that Satan doesn't, we don't let Satan use this desire to be uh, recognized as significant in the wrong way. You know, religious leaders have talked an awful lot about humility. But the world has noticed the hypocrisy of religious leaders in many cases. One pastor was asked, Pastor, what is the best book on humility? His answer was, the one I wrote by myself. (laughs) Bertrand Russell, and I think he was an atheist, he said, humility is preached by pastors, but it's practiced by the lower classes. In other words, they talk about it, but they don't do it. A Yiddish proverb said that uh, too humble is half pride. A person that's just too humble is probably proud about it. It's self-righteousness. Another word, another one in 1665. So this takes us back to the time of the pilgrims, the Puritans coming to this country. It says, many wish to be devout, but nobody wants to be humble. They want to be seen as religious, but they are not humble. Humility humility has been described several ways. Humility has its origins in an awareness of unworthiness. None of us deserve to be here. We're here because of God's mercy, God calling us, opening our minds to understand some things that the world doesn't understand. There's nothing to be vain about over that. 1850s, another person said that the first test of a truly great person is humility. The first test of a truly great person is humility. A fellow by the name of uh, Publilius Cyrus, he was apparently a Roman writer in the first century, He said, humility neither falls far nor heavily. He's paraphrasing a proverb, which we'll read in just a little bit. The point I want to make here is that the world has understood for thousands of years 
there are problems with vanity and problems with pride. It doesn't work well. And the world has also understood the value of humility. The question is, do we recognize the value of humility? Or do we look at, well, that's, that's for weak people. That's really not that important. I don't drink, I don't smoke. I might have a little vanity, but you know, that's, that's the way it goes. That's not the way God looks at things. Let's look at some scriptures. <clears throat> what is God's mind on these subjects? <clears throat> God does not take a neutral approach to pride. In Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19, <clears throat> this is God's view of the subject of pride. Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19. It says, These six things the Lord hates. Not a neutral word. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. The very first thing that's listed, a proud look. It says God hates this. It's an abomination. A proud look, a lying tongue. So it basically says pride and, and lying are, are very similar. Hands that shed innocent blood, murders other people. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that are swift to run <clears throat> to evil. A false witness who speaks lies and one who sows discord among the brethren. What we're told here is that God hates pride. And he categorizes it with these other very despicable behaviors. <clears throat> Proverbs 8 and verse 13. Proverbs 8 and verse 13. It says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way, and the perverse mouth, God says, I hate. These are really strong terms. God says, I hate these things. They're an abomination. Why does God hate these things? Proverbs 13 and verse 10. <clears throat> Proverbs 13 and verse 10. It says, by pride comes nothing but strife, but with the well-advised is Wisdom. You might write in your margin here in Proverbs 28, verse 25, where it says, the proud stir up strife. The proud stir up, they cause strife. If you're having problems with another person, you might ask yourself, could my pride be involved? Could my pride be involved? Again, I know what the church teaches, but you know, this is what I think. You've got to be careful with that, because that will lead us in wrong directions. <clears throat> in Proverbs 15, verse 25, you don't need to turn there, but you might want to jot it down. It says, the Lord will destroy the house of the proud. Again, these are not neutral terms. These, these are not, well, it's just a little thing. He says he's going to destroy the house of the proud. <clears throat> Proverbs 16, verse 5. You know, it's just it's like a shotgun here, one scripture after another, all focused on the same attitude. <clears throat> Proverbs 16, verse 5. Every one proud in heart is an abomination to God. See, this is why we want to get rid of this, why we want to identify it in our lives. And make every effort to get rid of it. Though they join forces, that is the proud join together, none will go unpunished. And then Proverbs 16, verse 18. Be interesting to talk with this fellow, um, Publilius Cyrus, the first century BC Roman writer. I wonder if he ever read Proverbs. It had been around for a thousand years. In Proverbs 16 and verse 18. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Now Solomon was writing about that about 900 to 1,000 B.C., 3,000 years ago. Pretty powerful stuff. A couple of other scriptures I think we need to notice. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel 16 is talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Now we all know that the problem in, so in Sodom was homosexuality. But notice what it says here in Proverbs 16, verse 49. As God is likening the children of Israel to Sodom and Gomorrah, it says, look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. I saw something in an argument here <clears throat> some time ago in an article that said homosexuality was not the problem in Sodom and Gomorrah. It was all these other things. It wasn't homosexuality. But it does say here at the end, they committed abomination. And that abomination was homosexuality. God talks about that in Leviticus chapter 18. But notice the environment in which homosexuality became a problem. Pride, fullness of food, plenty to eat, abundance of idleness, nothing else to do. And they got way off track. But it was their pride that took them in that direction. But again, this, this was Sodom and Gomorrah. This is not our problem today as Israelites, right? Let's turn to Amos, chapter 6 and verse 8. Amos, chapter 6 and verse 8. <clears throat> So the Lord God has sworn by himself, the Lord God of hosts says, I abhor the pride of Jacob and I hate his palaces. Therefore, I will deliver up the city and all that is in it. He's talking about a very materialistic lifestyle. You've got to have a big house, big car, big this, big that. While many other people in the world are starving just hanging on by their fingernails to try to survive. Yet we sit back, sip our wine, and have a good time. You know, God sees the entire panorama of human suffering. And we need to develop the compassion that we're going to have to have as leaders in the coming kingdom of God. Otherwise, how is he going to use us? He says, I hate the pride of Jacob and I hate his palaces. This, you, know, you have to look and read a little bit about Samaria, what it was like, and the leaders there, living in beautiful places, but they were living on the labors and the backs of other people where they were being exploited. You know, the, the trips I've made to um, Western Kenya, it's out in the country, out in the bush, <laughs> out in the sticks. You drive through some of these little villages. The roads aren't paved. It's all dirt. You drive by a little shop, and that's the, the supermarket. And there's some two-by-four shelves. There's a bags of beans and some sugar and some soft drinks and maybe some candy or something. And that's it. Then you come back to the States, and you walk into Publix, or you walk into Harris Teeter or something like that, and you look down these aisles <laughs> that go forever, and they're just chock full of anything that you can imagine. We live in a totally different world than most human beings do. And when God sees these things, you can understand where he's coming from when he makes these statements. Again, it's not wrong to enjoy the blessings that we've been given, but we've got to develop the compassion to want to change circumstances that are hurting other people. This is something we've got to develop. Now, we've been going through the Old Testament, but Jesus mentions the same thing in the New Testament about pride. Go to Mark chapter 7 and verse 20 to 23. Mark chapter 7. Now, here the Pharisees were kind of climbing onto Jesus and saying, look, your, your, your disciples are eating without washing their hands the way they should. They're not following the rituals that we've established and Jesus responds in verse 20. He said, what comes out of a man or what comes out of a person is what defiles the person. It's the attitudes. 
For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, this is envy, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these things, all these evil things come from within and defile a person. It's not the dirt on your fingers. It's the attitudes that Jesus was focusing on. He said, these things have got to go. 1 Timothy 3, verse 6. And we'll be done here in just a minute with this. But Paul was giving advice to Timothy. Here's how you run a church. Here's how... Here's what you look for in qualities and people that you want to put in leadership positions. That's interesting when you read this and how some people read it. So this is a faithful saying, verse 1. If a man or if a person desires the office or position of a bishop, he desires a good thing. A bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife. I remember talking with a fellow in Africa one time. He said, look, I've got several wives. I know I'll never be a minister. I said, well, this doesn't only just apply to, <laughs> to ministers. <laughs> this applies to Christians. You can't have a whole bunch of wives. And the same thing goes, you can't have a whole bunch of husbands either. <laughs> One in each town. See, it doesn't work that way. He's talking about qualities, but notice in verse 6, this is not a novice. Don't put someone in a position of responsibility that's new in the faith, that's inexperienced, that's young, not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride. They finally recognized who I am and what I can do. I remember one of the young couples that I spent some time with when I first came into the church. This guy's dad had some money. And we were sitting around eating one time. and said, you know, I'm going to be an elder by this time next year. I don't think he was even attending church a year later. But he'd picked out what he was going to do. He didn't realize, no, there's other qualities. There are other qualities to think about. And Paul was cautioning here. He said, not a novice, not somebody new, not somebody that's inexperienced, lest they will be lifted up with pride. And then Satan can begin to work with them and literally take them out of the church. You know, as we heard in the announcements that some people had showed up at one of the Tomorrow's World presentations, several ministers, and they wanted to share their beliefs. They, they wanted to bring more of their truth in to the church. It doesn't work that way. I remember I had a visit with a young fellow one time. He called and asked for a visit. I got there and he proceeded to tell me all kinds of things. And finally, I just said, well, thank you very much for inviting me, but apparently you didn't really need me to come because you have most of the answers. I said, I, I'll leave and I'll let you go. He called me up a day later and said, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think he was nervous. He said, I invited you there, but I did all the talking. Would you come back? I said, yes, I'd be willing to come back. He said, I'm really sorry. But he just got carried away. And he did come to church stayed for a number of years, and then wound up going someplace else. The point I want to make here is that the Bible says quite a bit about pride, and it's not good. It doesn't say a little bit's okay. <laughs> I can understand that. You know, everybody has it, so it's no big problem. No, when God says, I hate this stuff, it's an abomination, I'm going to destroy the house of the proud. That should shake us, brethren, to our boots. But we don't want to have anything like that. We want to get away from that. There's a number of interesting examples in the Bible. We don't have time to go through that. But Satan, what do you say in Isaiah 14? I will be like the Most High. I'm going to be on that throne. I remember talking with... Uh, <clears throat> a fellow who was an elder years ago that he was I think I met him the first time I attended with a global feast and I said uh, can I ask you a question he said go ahead I said did you work with a certain individual and did he ever tell you something 
and I told him what it was. <clears throat> Apparently, he had told this younger minister, he said, watch out for Mr. Dukach. He's going to go the whole way to the top. And he told them this back in the 60s. And when I met him, where I saw him, I asked him, did you say that? He said, I did. He said, I said some more things. <laughs> See, these things are obvious to people that have eyes to see. They see the characteristics. They see the tendencies. God sees these things. Human beings that were not even the church, not in the church, understood several thousand years ago, pride is not good. It will take us in a wrong direction and there will be serious consequences. And if we can grasp that, Solomon built a temple. He spent seven years building the temple. How long did he spend building his own house? Thirteen years. Nebuchadnezzar, what did he say looking over Babylon? Look at the great Babylon that I have built. He went insane shortly thereafter. And then when he got his sanity back, he wrote part of the Bible. He said, I've come to realize there is a God in heaven. These things are powerful, brethren. They're extremely powerful. We've got to be able to, we, we need to take the time, not just during Days of Unleavened Bread, it starts there, but through the year, periodically, sit down on a Friday night, look back over your week. Have I been proud this week? Have I been exercising the fruits of God's spirit this week? Or have the fruits of... <laughs> The flesh been too visible this past week. When somebody pulled in front of me, what did I say? <laughs> when somebody tramped on my toe, poked me in the eye, what did I say? How did I respond? Get out of here. <laughs> no, we can't do those things. Powerful things, brethren. These are things we need to look for. Let's be more positive, though. Let's look at the next section. What does the Bible say? about humility. Is humility just for kind of weak people? Yeah, they, they, they don't have any else going for them, so they better be humble. <laughs> what does the Bible say? In Psalm chapter 9, verse 12, just to notice how God views. Now, God has said a lot in the Bible about pride, and he's also said a lot in the Bible about humility. Psalm chapter 12, or excuse me, 9 and verse 12. It says that God avenges blood. He remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the humble. God does not forget the cry of the humble. He hears the prayers of the humble. And Mr. Ames wrote an article uh, for, tomorrow's, for Tomorrow's World magazine the March, April, 2005. It's talking about the answer to unanswered prayer. The answer to unanswered prayer. You want to have your prayer answered? Humbly beseech God. Humbly beseech God. Mr. Ames wrote another article in uh, Tomorrow's World. See, I'm trying to gain points here with Mr. Ames. <laughs> But he wrote another article in, uh, uh, I'm losing my points very rapidly. <laughs> it's Tomorrow's World, uh, November, December, 2006, entitled Seven Satanic Deceptions, one of which was pride. Now, he's not the only one that has written about these, I noticed on the Doing the survey, Dr. Meredith has mentioned pride and humility, the need for those, need for humility, not for pride. <laughs> but in editorials, other articles and sermons, it was interesting just looking some of these things up. And these, these things come out even in our news and prophecy things, the consequences of pride to a nation. But God does not forget the cry of the humble. Uh, Proverbs ten seventeen. God hears the desire of the humble. 
You talk to, about, God, talk to God about your desires. And if it's motivated for the right reasons, God is going to bless those. You know, I look back whenever I did a, a master's program at Loma Linda University. I was in a class with uh, young people. They're not real young. They were 20s, uh, maybe early 30s. But students from all over the world, from the Middle East, uh, from Africa, Asia. And as I was learning about other countries, I began thinking, you know, I'd really like to go to Africa sometime. I'd just like to go. I've been there about, I don't know, eight or ten times. But not uh, checking off my bucket list. <laughs> I was there for the church. And there were reasons. I remember the first time Carl McNair asked me, would you like to go to Africa? He didn't ask it that way. He said, Doug, we're sending money to Africa. We need someone to go and check on it. Would you like to go? And you might not come back. I said, is this an opportunity or a banishment? <laughs> no, but it was the desire that I had and prayed about actually came true, did not the way I expected it. But God knows what's in our heart. He knows what motivates us. You know, it's not wrong to want to get married. It's not wrong to, to want to do certain things. But if we can get those desires in harmony with God's plan and God's purpose then hang on to your seat because God will provide. <clears throat> he hears the desire of the humble. Turn to uh, <clears throat> Proverbs 22 and verse 4. Proverbs 22 and verse 4, and this really takes this out of just kind of a religious concept. Proverbs 22 and verse 4. It says, by the humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. In other words, humility is a key to success, real success. By humility and the fear of God, where you strive to obey God, that's what you want to do. That's your goal in life. Not to do your will, but God's will. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. It's the key to success. You can read in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, that Moses was humble or meek above all men. You know, this is stated about Moses in Deuteronomy. This is after the Israelites had wandered for 40 years in the wilderness and after Moses had spent 40 years herding sheep. After he'd spent 40 years herding sheep. You might think, well, that's no big deal. I grew up on a farm or whatever. No, this was after Moses had spent 40 years before that being raised in the palace of Pharaoh as heir to the throne of Egypt. May have been a general in, the, in one of the Egyptian armies. He made big decisions. It led a lot of people. What did he think about when he was herding sheep sitting out in the pasture? Why am I here? <laughs> what did I do <laughs> to deserve this? It was after those experiences that Moses is described as meek above all people. You know, Dr. Meredith has talked about his wilderness years in Hawaii, places like that. If anybody's been in a church for 30 or 40 years, I think we've all had our wilderness years, so to speak, where somebody misunderstood or we got the wrong end of the stick, we thought, or whatever. One of the things we need to realize is that God tests all of us. Turn to um, Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 2. Now, sometimes I think, I think the world especially overlooks scriptures like this. Deuteronomy chapter 8 in verse 2, <clears throat> I think the concept of God is, well, God is love and God is merciful and God just, you know, does everything for us and God will take care of us and God blesses us and all these things. But in Deuteronomy chapter 8, <clears throat> in verse 2, start in verse 1, it says, Every commandment which I have commanded you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live 
The, burden, the commandments are not a burden. They're there to help us live better lives. You know, obey my commandments, he says, that you may live, your life will go better and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. Why? To humble you and test you to know whether you would keep his commandments or not. You mean God actually does that? He tests us and tries us. First Corinthians, I think it's First Corinthians 3, where Paul said, be careful what you build with, because everything you build with is going to be tested and tried. You know, if we don't develop the humility that we need, God will help us. <laughs> If we're carrying this little bit of vanity that's not as bad as drinking or smoking or whatever, he'll probably allow that to come up, bubble up to the surface one way or the other, and it'll be embarrassing. I remember when I was doing a lot of visiting and I was asked a question, if I didn't take the time to find the answer and get back to the person, the question invariably came up again and I was embarrassed <laughs> because I'd already been asked before and I didn't take the time to get the answer. See, God will try us and test us. You know, the Israelites, when they went into the promised land, they were told, clear the land. In some cases, they didn't. And God said, I'm going to leave them there to test you, to see if you will begin adopting their ways. See, God wants to know what's in our heart. The only way he can know many times is to allow us to experience certain circumstances. But he's there for us. But we have to be wanting to grow in the right directions. <clears throat> so numerous scriptures. Uh, let's look at one more in Second, Second Chronicles, chapter 7. I think Dr. Meredith has referred to this on different occasions. And this is something we can focus on as a church. Second Corinthians, chapter se no, Second Chronicles, chapter 7 and verse 14. <clears throat> says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. You know, if as a church we literally turn to God, we beseech him and seek his face, and take the time to turn from our evil ways. We've got to recognize what those ways are. And begin to make the changes that we need to make. Then God is going to hear and bless his church. <clears throat> Why is this important? Let's look at a couple of other scriptures. Isaiah chapter 57. <clears throat> we could spend probably the rest of the sermon or the rest of the afternoon going through scriptures talking about Humility and the importance of it. <clears throat> but in Isaiah 57, <clears throat> verse 15, talking about the importance of humility. For thus says the <clears throat> high and the lofty one, who inhabits eternity and whose name is holy. We heard about that in the sermonette. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who is with him or with the person who has a contrite and humble spirit. This is a type of person that God dwells with. A person that has a contrite and humble spirit. What does it mean to be contrite? It means to be able to say, I'm sorry, I messed up, I want to change, I want to grow. And a humble spirit is, show me, God, the way I need to go. Not my way, but your way. Now, I grew up in a number of Protestant churches, and I heard a lot of people talking about, uh, I just want to find out what God's will is for my life. 
And I just want to do what God wants me to do. I want, to be, well, I want God to, to guide me. But I never heard people saying, I've found out what God wants me to do. <laughs> I know the direction God wants me to go. Never heard that. But it's here. Isaiah 66, 2, this should be a memory scripture, <clears throat> latter part of that verse. It says, but to this one or this person will I look. This is the person that God is looking towards. This is what he wants to see in us. On him who is poor, of a contrite spirit, and trembles at my word. Now you can put your hand in your pocket, probably not much money there, and you identify with being poor. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a humble person. A person who's willing to say, God, what do you want me to do? What direction do you want me to go? How do you want me to live my life? You know, we've encouraged people not to marry outside the church, outside of your faith, because it just creates problems. But, you know, the the thinking today is, well, but there's nobody in the church for me. (laughs) So I've, I've got to look outside. You know, th- these are not wise things to do. We come up with all kinds of reasons for doing what we're doing. But God said, I'm going to be looking for a person who is humble, who's a contrite spirit. You show me how to change, and I want to change. And who trembles at my word. And yet the approach is today, well, I know what the church says, but here's what I think. Here's what I think the book says. That's not trembling at the word of God. There's just probably a tiny element of pride there. No, there's probably a lot of it there. This is what God is looking for. We could go through a number of other scriptures. Um, Maybe just jot down a couple. Matthew 5, 3. The Beatitudes, the teachings of Jesus Christ and the Sermon on the Mount. What is the very first beatitude? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. A humble person. The very first beatitude. Matthew 18. Whoever humbles himself will be greatest in the kingdom of God. True Christianity, Romans 12, 16, is to mind not high things, but associate with the humble. I remember one time Mr. Waterhouse came to uh, New Orleans, I think it was. I was attending up in Jackson, Mississippi. And somebody said, let's go to New Orleans and hear Mr. Waterhouse. So we piled in the car, got down there, and we were listening to Mr. Waterhouse. And at the end of his sermon, we all walked up and we wanted to bask in the glory of Mr. Waterhouse. So we're just standing there. He's talking to us and we're talking to him. And he got the drift of what was happening. He said, let's go talk to these widows over here. So we thought... Why is he doing that? He saw a couple of young, vanity-filled boys <laughs> want to talk with this important person. And he says, let's, let's go over here. Let's focus on different people. Colossians 3.12, it says, the elect of God. Now, we're here because we feel we are the elect of God. And Paul is saying, he says, the elect of God should put on mercy, kindness, humility, Meekness, patience, forgiveness, and love. This is our goal. This is the goal of the process. 1 Peter 5, verses 1 to 6, Peter talks about being clothed with humility. We put it on so that we come across that way. We're not that important. God could replace all of us. It's a privilege to be able to be part of the work. But he doesn't need any of us. You know, he could use donkeys. Now, just how important is humility? Are we the only people that perceive how important it is? Came across a study, and this came out of Harvard Business Review. It's on the internet. It says, what catapults a company from merely good to truly great? A five-year research project searched for the answer to that question, and his discoveries ought to change the way we think about leadership. They looked at a number of different companies, very few companies, there was about 11, I think, that actually became great. 
They were good, but they became great. And they said that the reason they became great is that they had a leader who exemplified level five leadership. What's level five leadership? Let me just give you a little bit of background. Level one is to have highly capable individuals in the company, in the organization. You choose capable people. You need capable people to make a great organization. They've got to have talent, knowledge, skills, and so on. That's level one. Level two, these highly capable people have to be able to work together as a team. They have to be able to work together as a team. I remember a, fellow, a friend of mine was coaching a basketball team. Actually, it was at Ambassador College. And I said, why did you keep this person on the team? He says, not real tall. He's not real fast. Uh, not a real great ball handler. He said, he's a good team member. He's a good team member. You know, we lived in Boston for about 10 years whenever Larry Bird was playing basketball for the Boston Celtics. And there's one fellow, J.L. Carr, I think his name was. He didn't play that much. He's a good player. But he never played that much, never got into the games. But he was always on the sidelines when a score was made. He was waving his towel, go, go, go. <laughs> he was a spark plug on the team, even though he didn't play that much. He got in whenever they were winning by 20 points. But he was a team member. He was a team player. He made the team kind of come alive. Great companies. Their members work together as a team. Level number three, they've got competent management. In other words, the management can organize people to achieve goals. We're going to organize to do this. We're going to work together to do that. And they make that goal very clear. Level number four, <clears throat> they have leaders that foster commitment to a compelling vision. You know, of all the organizations on the earth, we have a compelling vision to be in the kingdom of God, to change the world. Not many companies have visions like that, that are that compelling. This is what you've been called to become part of, to literally change the world one of these days. Level five, and this is what the uh, study came up with. The factor that made good companies great. They had leaders with deep personal humility. They had leaders with deep personal humility. Important. The world has come to conclude or understand these are powerful concepts. It's not just little Bible stories. These are powerful concepts. Why does God want to see humility in us? We're to become kings and priests in the coming kingdom of God to lead the world in a totally different direction. And we've got to have the appropriate humility to do that. Let's tie this together. <clears throat> what does this mean to you and me today? What will our attitude be if we are humble and contrite and tremble at the word of God? What will our focus be? What will we look like as people? What will we be thinking about? What will we be focused on? <clears throat> A number of these, I'll give you the scripture. Number one, Matthew six thirty three. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, and what else? His righteousness. Is that your focus? Is that my focus? To seek first. I want to be in the kingdom of God. I want to learn to walk in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, to keep his commandments, not to argue with them, but to focus on those things. Matthew 6, If we're trembling at the word of God, that's where we're going to be focused. That's going to be the most important thing in our life. Matthew 20, verse 26 to 28, where the disciples again were, 
This was the case where John, James and John's mother came to Jesus. Said, Jesus, I've got these two wonderful boys, and I just have a small favor to ask, that they only sit on your right hand and your left hand and read the account. How did the other disciples respond to that? They got their mom. They got their mom to ask Jesus if they could just be the, have the top jobs in the kingdom. Who do they think they are? What are they doing? <laughs> what was Jesus' response? He says, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, become a servant. Look for ways to serve. Not to gain accolades, not to be important. Look for ways to serve. Number three, Matthew 7, verses 1 to 5. Part of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, judge yourself. Look for the beam in your own eye. Quit looking for the beam in other people's eyes. See, examine yourself. Get rid of what doesn't belong there. You know, it's always easier to see the problems of other people. That's easy. But seeing our own is, is more of a challenge. If we're looking in the mirror, and we ask mirror, mirror on the wall, <laughs> who is the vainest of them all? And the mirror gets very foggy. It doesn't want to tell you. <laughs> the mirror wants to survive and live another day. <laughs> Is, you know, don't judge other people, judge, judge yourself. Number four, Mark 16, 15, Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel. This should be our focus. We've got a job to do. I was reading in a paper this morning, the Wall Street Journal, it talks about uh, so many people are into what they call selfies today. Take your picture, put it on the internet. Put something about yourself on the internet. Get people to like what you put on the internet. The world is focused on self today as opposed to being focused on others, serving other people. Focus on preaching the gospel of the good news of the coming kingdom of God. We've got a work to do. In John 4.34, Jesus said, My meat, my, my focus is to do the will of God and to finish his work. You know, we're probably running out of time. We may not have that much more time to go. But we've got a job to do. That's got to be our focus. Number five, Revelation 5, 10, Isaiah 30, verses 20 and 21. We've been called to prepare to rule on this earth with Jesus Christ, to teach God's way of life to point people in a totally different direction, to point them to a way of peace. Peace with themselves, peace with other people, peace between nations. <clears throat> you know, this is what the Days of Unleavened Bread is really all about. It's an important opportunity to remind ourselves or to be reminded that we need to regularly examine ourselves and look carefully at our lives, not just once a year, but throughout the year, to take some time to evaluate very carefully. I'd like you to look at one other scripture as we close. In John, we read this in the Passover, John 15. <clears throat> now, the idea floats around today that uh, God's laws are a burden if you're going to stay in the, the church, you're going to uh, limit your happiness in life. And uh, you're just going to miss out on life. And yet notice what Jesus told his disciples. Let's start in verse 14, John 15, verse 14. He's talking to the disciples the night before he's crucified. He was going over things that are extremely important that he wanted his disciples to understand. Now put that in the context of the ideas that float around today, that well, God's church will keep you from being fully happy. You'll never really experience the joys of life. You're going to miss out on all kinds of things. Jesus told his disciples, verse 14, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. There's a condition there. If you do what I command you to do, and God will see that. Jesus Christ will see that. 
He sees you striving to do that. He said, there's one of my friends. There is one of my friends. Now, people like to drop names today. Well, I know so-and-so, and he'll get me a job. You can drop a name, too. I know Jesus Christ. He's my friend. He's my friend because I'm doing what he's asked me to do. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master does or is doing. But I've called you my friends, for all things that I've heard from my father I've made known to you. Now here is the key, verse 16. You did not choose me. I chose you. You know, when you talk to people, how did you come across the church? Well, or, well, I came across the broadcast, or I picked up this magazine, or I did this or that. Now, Jesus said, you didn't choose me. You didn't find me. And when you talk to people, it's very interesting ways in which they came across the truth. In some cases, I remember I was in a board meeting one time, and this man walked in with Plain Truth magazine of a starving child on the front. And I, I could barely sit through the meeting because he wasn't part of the church. I was really curious, what's going on? As we were leaving, I said, that's an interesting looking magazine. Where did you find that? He said, I saw it on a newsstand and I couldn't stop from picking it up. <laughs> now, I don't know they did anything with it. Other people find magazines in garbage cans, <laughs> find it accidentally in their mailbox, but God has ways of reaching people. He said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Put your name in there. I chose you and appointed you that you should go forth and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. And whatever you ask of the Father in my name, I'm going to give to you. We have been given an incredible opportunity to be part of the process that God is using to prepare sons and daughters to become part of his family. Don't be sidetracked by ideas that, well, it's not important, you're going to miss out on things. You've been called to be part of the greatest work on the face of the earth that's going to change the world. Don't miss out on that opportunity. Do your part to get rid of the vanity, to develop the humility, the qualities of character that God is going to be able to use you to help change the world.